burnout is a bad time. Thanks for watching, everyone. Like and subscribe. Comment and Patreon. Bye! <sighs> okay. Suck it up, man. Suck it up. You can do this. You can do this. In my psychedelics video, I made a passing allusion to my experiences with depression, that I had dipped my toe into a world where many people live their entire lives and struggle endlessly to escape. The world of nothingness, where doing your favourite thing becomes a chore, where effort is painful to even think about. The world where everything is shit. I don't live in that world very often, but I've vacationed there enough to know a bit about it. What I didn't elaborate on was how I got there. Depression is a symptom, not a condition unto itself, and like any condition, it has a root, a cause, even if that cause is hard to see when you're depressed because, you know, thinking becomes hard. But I know now. In the beginning of 2019, I had been working on PQ for three years. PQ stands for Psychiatric Intensive Care Unit, and it's pretty much what it says on the tin. If you have a psychotic episode and get into a situation where the police arrest you, you'll be sectioned under the Mental Health Act on a thing called a Section 136, a very short section that the police can use when they deem you to be in urgent need of care or control. Think of it as legal handcuffs. Then you get assessed to see if you need to stay in hospital. Basically, if you present as a threat to yourself or others, you get sectioned. If you get sectioned and are considered a high risk of flight, violence or suicide attempts, you wind up on PQ. As you can imagine, or possibly even remember, this meant we came into contact with a lot of people whose risk profile was, shall we say, complex? I can't get into details about everything I saw in those three years due to NHS confidentiality rules. If I get so specific that people could recognise themselves as the one being talked about, I'm liable to get prosecuted. What I can talk about is the everyday stuff I had to deal with, which included, but were not limited to, verbal insults on my appearance and character, threats of violence, actual violence, preventing people from self-harming by cutting ligatures, burning, headbanging, etc. Preventing people from committing suicide by any of the above. Preventing people from fleeing the hospital. Assisting in administration of medication under restraint. Death threats, rape threats, castration threats, threats of blackmail, preventing major damage to the building, accusations of being a part of a global paedophile conspiracy to fake the moon landing, and karaoke. Okay, okay, not all of those things actually happened to me. We weren't allowed a karaoke machine, it was considered too risky. Needless to say, it was hard work. It was stressful work. Just keeping everyone, especially those in our care, safe could be extremely difficult sometimes. Now, was it all bad all the time? No, of course not. This level of what we call acuity was sort of intermittent, but when it started to rain, it often became a hurricane that was very difficult to stop. As a result, by the end of my time there, I was very anxious at work. I was on watch all the time for signs of self-harm, aggression, suicidal intention, environmental risks. Trust me, you wouldn't believe what people can self-harm with when they really try. I had to be on guard all the time. At no point during a shift could I take my eye off the ball, and the shifts were anything between 8 and 14 hours long. Followed me outside of work too, despite trying my damnedest not to let it. One time a cash register in a shop made the same noise as our alarms did, and like one of Pavlov's dogs, my body immediately responded by dumping adrenaline, raising my heart rate, and readying me to defend myself. I left the shop shaking a little, praying no one had noticed. To this day, if a voice gets raised in a crowded bar, and it seems like a fight might be about to start, I can't help but casually place myself in sprinting range, in case something happens and someone needs to be restrained. I don't want to say that I hated my job, because I didn't. The ward staff were pretty much all beautiful, compassionate souls, people who cared more about the safety and well-being of their patients than anything else. We kept people safe, and we did it in the best way we could. I can safely say that my time as activities coordinator on that ward contained some of the best times of my working life. I felt like I was achieving something with every smile, every laugh, every good day, every conversation where someone would disclose something that had hurt them, and I could help them feel better about it. Every time I heard, thank you. After years of being on guard, however, something flipped in my brain, and I just couldn't turn it off anymore. I was jumpy, restless, hypervigilant for anything that could spiral into an incident. My off time had devolved into just trying not to think about work. Even when work had calmed down, and there was no reason to worry about daily incidents anymore, 
I couldn't stop the anxiety while I was there. The restlessness, the fear, the stress. The feeling that everything around me was falling apart and I had to do something about it, but there was nothing I could do. And the reason was because I was terrible at life and I couldn't hack it because I was... I started snapping at my colleagues. I once even took a sharp tone with a patient for no reason and spent the entire shift apologising. I started having recurring thoughts of not wanting to be anymore. One day I woke up and after reaching for the door handle several times, my best friend and roommate found me, sat down trying to make sense of what I was feeling. They just asked me outright, do you think you can handle going in today? All I could do was shake my head. I tried my best to deny that I shook my head, even though I was crying and shaking and numb inside. I tried to match him my way through it, even nearly barging past him and insisting I would be fine. One more time. I'd be fine when I got there. This is no big deal. My feelings didn't matter. They stopped me, looked me dead in the eye, and said, They do matter. You matter. I called in sick that day. Work booked me a visit with the Occupational Health the next Tuesday. And that's how I got diagnosed with burnout. Yay! <laughs> Burnout is a video game developed in 2000... Sorry, 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 couldn't resist it. Burnout, as a concept, was coined by Freudenberger in 1970, but was really codified and described in detail by Maslach about a decade later. Maslach identified three descriptive components of burnout, and these components form the backbone of the modern definitions used by the WHO. Number one, emotional exhaustion. This refers to the exhaustion felt from experiencing intense emotions, usually negative ones, more frequently than you're really prepared for. The wording is a little misleading, however, because emotions do not exist in a vacuum. They have physical consequences and mechanisms, like neurochemical actions in the brain and hormonal reactions in the body. For example, humans release cortisol when we feel stressed. Cortisol has numerous effects on the body, like messing with your immune system, messing with your skin, screwing your digestion up. You know that anxious, fluttery feeling in your stomach? That involuntary thing that comes out of nowhere and feels like a muscle spasm and it's really distracting in conversations? Yep, that is cortisol, just doing its thing. It also messes with the production of serotonin, the neurotransmitter that allows you to feel happiness and is important for forming memories. Too much cortisol is a nightmare for your memory, cognition and just feeling emotions generally. Emotional exhaustion, while named as such, affects the body just as much as it does the brain. Number two, cynicism and depersonalization. Do you hate your job? Do you feel like a cog in the machine? That your input doesn't matter at all? That the world is made no different by your actions? You might even be making it worse rather than better? The answer is probably yes. <coughs> Alienation from labor, <coughs> gig economy. <coughs> that feeling is the second key part of burnout. During my early time in the PQ, 
I often hand waved away my negative emotions and feelings of stress by saying, it doesn't matter, we're fighting the good fight here. This admittedly LARPy defense mechanism was something that kept me sane for most of my time there. It didn't really matter I would come home with bruises, having had to restrain someone, or having seen something pretty traumatic that I would never be able to forget. If I was able to speak freely without identifying anyone by accident, oh boy. But as long as I was helping people, fighting the good fight, I could take anything. This positive opinion of my job slowly began to break down, however. Seeing the same patients return multiple times to the ward, and the incidents becoming more frequent due to stupid blanket rules from high up, it eroded my certainty that I was making a difference. One nurse confessed to me once, it just feels like we're putting out fires all the time. That's all we can do. That, that right there is the cynicism that begins to creep in. Eventually it crept into my thinking too. We aren't fixing the cause of the fires, we're just fighting them. A lot of people over the years fall prey to this cynical thinking, and the constant disrespect we were given by the management of the NHS, up to the governmental level, certainly didn't help. During COVID, the cynicism has only gotten more intense and more justified. Seriously, if you try and tell a nurse that the government is looking out for them, you're going to be the one who ends up in hospital. Cynicism about your job is not just a direct cause of burnout per se, but in emotionally intensive jobs, it does remove one of your key defense mechanisms, that rewarding feeling of doing a basic, necessary good. And trust me, you need that if you want to keep going. Number three a reduction in professional efficacy and accomplishments. In Corpo Shill speak, this is impaired workplace performance, or decreased productivity. In actual person language, it basically means not being as good at your job. Now, for your average shelf stacker or cubicle exister, this might not have too many external outcomes, really. Not many people would mind if you scan items one-tenth of a second slower than normal. In the medical field, however, Having a highly burnt out staff can have severe and life affecting consequences. Reductions in the quality of care being given, lower patient well being, even increases in medical errors and lawsuits. This can cause a sort of cycle. If you pride being good at your job, as I do, noting that your burnout levels are affecting your job, making your attitude towards patients negative, making you a little slower to react to a situation, that can make you feel really shitty about it, increasing the level of burnout reducing the quality of work, which makes you feel shitty and round around, round. you get it. This self-critical element of burnout is probably the hardest to stop due to its cyclical nature. If you stop caring about how well you do your job, you become more cynical about your job, so that won't fix it. If you try caring even harder and doing better, then you increase the intensity of emotional exhaustion, so that won't fix it either. Learning to forgive yourself and carrying on positively is pretty hard when the consequences of mistakes are medical ones. I can remember each of my mistakes as clearly as if it just happened, while remembering my positive contributions is more difficult. I saw nurses, support workers, and even doctors spend a long time punishing themselves for errors or for bad practice or even simple mistakes. It was only the support of each other that could really help, forgiving each other and working together to fix the mistake without assigning blame, and that literally saved us sometimes. It's why burnout is much more common in healthcare than elsewhere. The consequences of failure are high, and the stakes only add to the stress, anxiety, and emotional exhaustion I mentioned earlier. The reduction of professional efficacy is a fancy way of saying once you start fucking up, it makes the chances of fucking up again higher, if you don't have a support network to help you debrief and process it. So these three elements are the core of what we mean when we say burnout. They describe the causes pretty well, but so far all we have is a sort of distant and impersonal diagnosis thing. This is a human condition though, so the real question should be, what are the consequences for people who burn out? And what are the consequences of that for the systems we work in? In short, it's shit and it fucks your life up. In long, oh boy. Burnout was originally conceived as having 12 stages, but these have been compressed down to five. The stages are, Honeymoon, stress, chronic stress, burnout, and habitual burnout. The first stage is pretty self-explanatory. If named like your boomer aunt describing her failing first marriage and smugly predicting yours will go the same way. This is when you feel good about the job. You skip to work with a smile and everything is peachy keen like a jelly bean. 
You feel satisfied and contented. You feel creative and happy to help. Challenges at work are approached with positivity and confidence. If you're lucky, you get to stay here forever. But for most of us, that's simply not the case. Stress is a pretty common expression. Everyone gets stressed at work sometimes, right? The boss treats you like a slave, puts a steaming pile into your in-tray at 4.30 on a Friday, and casually mentions the office is open on Saturday if you want to get ahead of the pack, slugger. This kind of thing causes an emotional and physical reaction to occur within your brain. Be it that hot, frustrated feeling or that sinking, resigned feeling, that is a stress response. In health work, this can be amplified by an inherent moral obligation that comes with a job. And these simple reactions can start to have effects on all sorts of things. From emotional things like anxiety, cognitive stuff like your ability to concentrate, or behavioural patterns like ignoring your own needs and working without eating. While there are physical effects at this stage, they aren't the primary focus yet. They might be irritating, but they aren't impeding you exactly. That bit comes next. Chronic stress is where all the stress problems I mentioned earlier, for lack of a better term, reach their evolved form. Lack of sleep becomes persistent tiredness. Irritability becomes resentfulness. Inability to focus becomes procrastination. Lack of self-care becomes outright self-destruction. Oh yeah, I could really go for some self-destruction right about now. The social withdrawal element deserves particular mention here. Socialising is an important coping mechanism for negative emotions. Having a laugh with your mates after work or at the weekend is an important release valve for negativity and a reminder that good times can still be had. Withdrawing from these things due to a lack of energy or worrying about bringing the mood down is often the beginning of a self-fulfilling downward spiral for those suffering with chronic stress. Isolation and being stuck with your own negative thoughts without anyone or anything to distract you from them makes those thoughts, those resentments, those washed out feelings and your own personal cynicism feel like your entire world. And attempting to cope with those things alone, especially with the more common substances available these days, can often be counterproductive. Depressants, funnily enough, do not make you happy. They just make you numb. Eagle-eyed or experienced viewers out there might be looking at these symptoms and noticing a pattern here, but don't worry, don't worry, we'll get there. Burnout is... Well, if moving from stress to chronic stress was an evolution, this is where the symptoms go super saiyan. The negative thoughts are now the norm, not the exception. The thoughts become not just a problem, but an active intrusion in your thinking. Every day, especially when you aren't doing something, you think something along these lines. I can't do this. I can't handle this. I'm so worthless. This is pointless. I need to get out of here. I want to just leave. These thoughts don't just affect your mood. They affect your behavior. You spend so much energy fighting them off, just trying to concentrate on what you're supposed to do, that you find yourself avoiding any extra stress wherever possible. You start to cut corners to avoid conflict, to take the easy options. You become worse at what you do and you spent your downtime thinking about your mistakes to the point of obsession. Even if you haven't really made any, you worry about it to the point of hating yourself. Nonsensical? Yes, but it's mental health. I got news for you, pal. You ain't leading but two things right now. Jack and shit. And Jack left town. This part is also where we encounter the undeniable physical effects. More than just feeling exhausted, you feel like your body is actively breaking down, with you trapped inside it. Strange things start to happen chronic headaches, random muscle twitches, random bouts of sweating and heavy breathing, the kind that trigger anxiety effects. This is the result of adrenaline spiking in response to even the tiniest level of stress and the overabundance of cortisol flooding your system. This is your body's way of telling you in no uncertain terms, stop. By this point, your personal life has stopped being difficult and has become non-existent. The idea of going out, enjoying time with your friends, doing anything after work, become such a daunting process that people will simply stop. You work, you sleep, you work, you sleep. Over and over and round and round it goes. The self-destructive urge becomes more and more intense. Many people sink into alcohol or drugs, the anesthetics that allow you to forget the pain and ignore what's happening to you, ignoring what you really need. A sort of imposter syndrome creeps in. You put on a mask to face your patients, to be positive for others, which, especially in my line of work, is critical to keep yourself and others safe. The mask gets heavier and thicker every day until it feels like it's made out of lead. 
I had a punch bag at home, and there would be times when I had the house to myself that I would hit that bag for hours, screaming, mostly at myself. But who cares, right? I'm doing the good thing. I'm fighting the good fight. I'm making the world better. What I do is important. I made a sick girl smile today. That should be enough, right? How selfish of me, putting my needs before the needs of my patients. They need my help. I can't give up on this. This is the only thing I'm good at. And what does it matter if I keep having these thoughts about that? No, 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 I just need to work harder. Stay busy, stay sane. What does it matter what I feel? Feelings don't matter because I don't matter. I never mattered. I've always just been a worthless piece of shit. But now that I'm not anymore, I have to help people. And I help people because that's who I am. If I don't help people, I'm just another fucking wasted shit. again with no reason to live besides destroying myself and turning my friends Sorry for indulging a little there, but it's one thing to tell someone what the feeling of burnout is like, and it's another thing entirely to let you inside my brain just before it broke. What happened to me next was the little story I opened up this video with, and while my story may be different to other people's in the fine details, I know that for many others, they too had a day when they realised they couldn't do it anymore. I was lucky. I had my friends to catch me when I fell, and I didn't have kids to look after. The only moral obligation I had was to myself. But many of us do have kids, mortgages, parents to look after. Some people struggle onwards. He who gazes into the abyss, beware. The abyss gazes back. The last stage of burnout is what happens when society, the need to make money, the need to feed your kids and stay gainfully employed at all times, prevents you from walking away. A cycle begins. You burn out, you leave work for a while or change workplace, you go back to work burn out, you leave for a while. Now, many of you might just be saying, why not just change career? Well, many have and many try. But going from burnout-based depression, going from a job that used to bring you happiness into, what, sales associate? Stacking shelves? Factory line work? Often for low pay and still shite hours? Yeah, I tried that, Chief. It wasn't the fix you think it was. The upshot of being caught between this rock and this hard place is quite simply depression, anxiety, and all the wacky effects that come with it. I survived and kept working for a little while thanks to the help of antidepressants, as many in my profession and across the NHS did and still do. But honestly, it was never the same again. And for me at least, it probably never can be. While I still work for the NHS to this day, I'm not a full-timer anymore, and every time I've tried to be, it's... well, see the above cycle. So yeah, that sounds pretty heavy, right? Sounds like a lot to go through. But surely burnout is an extreme situation, right? How often does this really happen? Is this just a story time animation without the animation you made to vent your frustrations on the verbal punching bag of the video-based internet? Well, folks, strap in. I've got some numbers for you. Burnout is not an official diagnosis in the strictest sense. As such, the information we have refers to the three elements of burnout rather than a single diagnosed disorder, which is the problem for assessing the scale of the problem. In this report from the Health Ministry, which I have named the Jeremy Cunt Report for obvious reasons, Dr. West testified, we need to establish a single measure across our healthcare system which gives us clear, standardized indication of the scale of this problem. So some of the numbers I'm going to be looking at are from studies that cover workplace stress-related illnesses because they're pretty much the same thing. Blah blah blah, numbers nerd, stop dancing around and get to the point. How many people are suffering from- Okay, alright, you want numbers? I've got numbers. 53% of clinicians and staff in the US report experiencing burnout. Roughly one third of physicians are suffering from burnout at any given time. 40% of NHS staff report coming unwell due to stress in the workplace. 46% of NHS staff report going to work despite not feeling well enough to perform their duties. Worldwide, 11% of nurses report being burnt out. In the US, burnout accounts for 33% of clinician turnover and 42% of other staff turnover every single year. So this is a large number of people who are still working, but are just a few bad days away from total emotional collapse. Seems pretty bad, right? Right? Did I mention these numbers are pre-COVID? Yeah! In the current climate, depression levels in NHS workers went from 5% to 21%. Severe anxiety went from 8% to 36%. Extreme stress went from 11% to 46%. 
That's an increase of 300% on average during the first wave of the pandemic. And these are just averages we're talking about here. There are more specific experiences that make your risk of burnout symptoms even higher. If a patient asks you if they're going to die, add 35 to 45% depression and anxiety risk, add 110% to the risk of PTSD. If you have to perform a resuscitation, 70% anxiety and depression, 125% increase in PTSD. If you lose a loved one to COVID, same, but add 25 more risk of PTSD. If your colleagues start getting COVID, the risks tripled. And if you're unfortunate enough to be one of the higher level nurses responsible for trying to manage this mess, the risk of symptoms went up by 500%. Yes, five times more likely. Probably due to trying to manage a massive spike in demand while struggling to fix the PPE shortages and having to deal with anti-mask COVID deniers demanding their free speech rights to scream at you whenever they want. Black and minority ethnic workers, who I must stress have been a vital part of the NHS for over 60 years, over 75% of whom have suffered racial abuse on the job, were 50% more at risk of PTSD and were much more concerned about the PPE shortage and their own safety. This may have something to do with the fact doctors of colour requesting PPE were more likely to be refused. The minority and immigrant communities are also overrepresented in social care, where most of the people were dying and the government was making its most shitty decisions. These communities often have lower financial standing on average, which means that the pressure to keep working no matter what throughout the whole pandemic was even higher. But hey, Boris said we're the least racist country in Europe again, and that must be true because he's never been caught lying, has he? I mean, it's not as if lying is the only reason he ever had a job. And it's not as if we've all known that forever. The country elected him anyway because of a stupid bus with a lie on it that was a cover-up for the bigotry and anti-immigrant sentiment he spent his entire career dog-whistling and later capitalised on in two collection campaigns while secretly planning to sell the NHS to private American business interests. Is it? Okay, okay, breathe. Calm down. <laughs> that was a lot of info to dump on you all at once. My dumping nussels are knackered. Uh, phrasing? This all sounds horribly depressing on its own, but I have to remind you here, a lot of these numbers are from the first wave of the pandemic. Newer numbers are harder to come by, but I haven't seen anything persuading me it's gotten better. Now, I'm not just going to throw bad numbers at you. I want to get to a part where I explain why it's gotten this bad. But before I do, there are probably a few people out there reacting to these numbers with the usual rack of Tory bloviating. Well, it's what you signed up for. Why are you complaining? It's your job. Stop focusing on yourself, you selfish, entitled millennials. Well, the same report from the University of Roehampton that gave me these numbers also had this to say. In spite of extreme difficulties on a daily basis, their own mental health was considered an extremely low priority among all healthcare workers. They kept working anyway, even when it was killing them. I wasn't a full-timer anymore during COVID-19, but I was there, working the wards and helping out when I could. I remember the constantly changing guidelines, the fear of getting infected and spreading it around the ward without realising it, not knowing how bad it was going to get, and worrying that people you knew, people you loved, were going to die. And I remember how nobody, nobody stopped caring. Not for a second. So if you have anything bad to say about NHS staff, Fuck you, and fuck your parents for raising you that way. It would be very easy just to say the Tories here and clock off for lunch, but sadly, I am an obsessive nerd, and the mechanics of why people things happen never really get old for me. Though yes, I'm dragging you along to hell with me, no bathroom stops and no trip to the gift shop. As I said earlier, burnout comprises three elements, emotional exhaustion, cynicism and reduction in ability. So if we want to look at why the burnout has gone up, we need to look at the things that have affected these things. Emotions are an inherent part of working in healthcare. Care is in the name after all. I would go further and say that caring is a requirement for working in the healthcare service. It's a messy, unpleasant job sometimes. The hours are long and taxing. There is a lot more urine and feces and you know, human suffering than you would get working at Waitrose. No one would go into that willingly and keep showing up every day if they didn't care at least a bit. This emotional stress is expected though. You know what you're going to see and feel in there. I did. Covid, however, has increased the exposure to pain, suffering, loss, heartbreak and death to the nth degree. While before being witness to traumatic events and coming home with a fresh, dark memory, 
was common, but the occurrences were usually spaced out enough that you had time to process them. During COVID, however, they became constant, especially on emergency wards where they were fighting to keep people breathing, having to keep families from seeing their loved ones to prevent the spread of the virus, having to hear people say goodbye over the phone or on Zoom. This went from a rare occurrence to a day-to-day one. This increase in emotionally taxing events is a big factor in the burnout rates increasing, as the Roehampton study showed earlier. But this is just the nature of working in health during a pandemic, right? We can't change that. Yeah, probably not. But there are things that could have been done differently, and weren't. The British government, for lack of a better term, initially really fucked up on the PPE situation, creating a tidal wave of fear and anger in the health service from care assistant to ward manager to the chief executive of the NHS. Here's a fun one. The British government was offered, and refused, large-scale EU procurement efforts because, well, you know. This mishandling, and the non-apologies the government was making throughout, created a background noise of panic and anxiety. Everyone was worried that the PPE would just run out one day. Calls by the cabinet to treat PPE like the precious thing it is were not helping. Trying to fight a pandemic when you're worried about running out of masks and gloves is a bit like trying to fight a war when you're worried about running out of bullets or tank fuel. Instead of focusing on victory, now you're just worried about making it to the next day alive. The other compounding fact was even more infuriating though, and that was the hoaxers, the anti-maskers, and the complete fucking idiots. Abuse of NHS staff has been a constant presence for years, as wait times have gotten longer and longer due to chronic underfunding across several Tory governments, and the system has been made slowly less and less accessible. With Covid overloading the system, and of course a nice sprinkling of conspiracy nutters refusing to wear masks and screaming fake science at doctors who are trying to save lives, the abuse has gotten a lot worse and a lot more personal. Over 30% of nurses report being verbally assaulted. Over 15% report being physically assaulted. Racial abuse, of course, increased even more. Turns out people stupid enough to believe 5G towers are causing Covid and who punch nurses for doing their job are also stupid enough to be racist. What a surprise. It's gotten so bad that some staff are having to wear body cams. Yes, US police-style body cams, a measure that was introduced to try and dissuade police from shooting black people, is now being used to dissuade members of the public from screaming abuse and hitting nurses. Each part of this whole cluster bomb of factors, the constant exposure to trauma, the abuse from the public, the climate of fear sown by governmental fuck-ups, would be bad enough by itself. But this slide from bad to the seventh layer of hell happened all at once. It's like enjoying a lovely Sunday picnic in the park, and suddenly you realise you put the blanket down in the tiger enclosure, and the zookeeper has gone home for the night. You're stuck there until sunrise. And now you have to perform surgery on people who hate you for no reason because they were stupid enough to kick the tiger in the balls and expect it not to bite them. Oh, and you haven't got any gloves, sorry. You may last a month, a year, even two years, but when you don't know how long you'll have to stay in this mess, the emotional exhaustion becomes only a matter of time, as is the next part of the burnout triad. Now, a lot of people are cynical about the government, about each other, about the very meaning of existence itself. But what people often get wrong is assuming that cynicism and pessimism are the same thing. They aren't. Pessimism is the belief that all outcomes will be negative. Cynicism is the belief that motivations of others are negative. In the context of the health service, cynicism manifests as the belief that, just maybe, the people in charge, the people running the NHS, the people with power over your job, are motivated by something other than keeping the NHS running well. Now, NHS staff are probably dying of laughter and falling out of their chairs with this because, believe me, every conversation between staff about the job turns into a bitter anti-government screed within five minutes. It's like the law of gravity at this point. Everyone knows, and has known for years, that the government not only doesn't care about us, they actively try to make our jobs more difficult. Through lack of funding, lack of respect for what we do, and by enforcing heavy-handed top-down policies while selling parts of the NHS, including your job, off to their mates. If you prefer stats as evidence that cynicism is on the rise, this study into paramedics shows that 9 out of 10 report feeling depersonalization at work. 
the feeling that they are a cog of the state machine and nothing more. If a Tory MP walked into an NHS handover meeting, their mind and soul would immediately collapse under the sheer psychic weight of how much people in that room despise them. And that's a good thing. Why? Because it's an accurate reading of the situation. That's why. Let's get some context, shall we? In 2011, during the credit crunch, or my preferred name, the Great Fisting, the government froze all public sector pay rises for two years and capped them at 1% after that, until strike threats and being upstaged by the much more sensible Scottish government pushed them into scrapping it in 2018. Now, an idiot might say, Pay rise is frozen? Well, that doesn't sound too bad. You bloody millennials, you're not entitled to it, bruh. Let me finish. Both inflation and the rising cost of living during the last decade have been much, much higher than 1% a year. So in real terms, in a world where you have to spend money to eat food and live in a building, that was a pay cut to people who were already not paid well enough. Even after the cap was lifted, the 6% increase in nursing pay over three years? That wasn't even close to enough for people whose cost of living went up by 26%. During the pandemic, while everyone was banging pots and pans out of their windows to support us, the government was pausing pay rises to the public sector, actively cutting our pay while boasting loudly and wrongly about how great the country was doing. Even now the pause has been lifted, we have another pittance offer. Nowhere near enough to overcome the rising prices, rising inflation, rising rents, rising national insurance contributions of the last 10 years. It's for this reason we are seeing the rise of nurses full-time nurses having to utilize emergency food banks just to keep the lights on and the kids fed. But when a spokesperson for the Department of Health and murdering old people in nursing, I mean social care, opens his mouth and lets this bullshit escape into the world, you are quite right to tell him it doesn't matter and that the NHS staff will require 15% more to have enough to live as they were a decade ago. That's why unions are asking for exactly that. The pay for the NHS workforce has been very low for a very long time, and a lot of us are struggling. It's not a secret. We all know it. The government know it. We know the government know it. And they know that we know they know it, but we'll go to work anyway because if we don't, we'll end the side down. And it's not just the pay, is it? It's about something else just underneath it. The low pay is a symptom of something much bigger that we don't often talk about, but we all feel. We don't have a say on how any of this works, do we? We don't have the ability to propose ideas or even address the problems we see every day with the NHS policies we are expected to enact or enforce. Even the managers don't really have the power to change things. If they go outside budget to keep staffing levels safe, or if they tread on the wrong toes trying to get a patient's needs met, they can get squeezed out too. You never know when a new policy will come down from on high and royally screw things up. The cynicism isn't just about how we are treated. It's that our faith in the system is broken, and we can't do anything to fix it. The system seems to be limiting our ability to do our job rather than helping. Speaking of which... The NHS has been subjected to major, severe cuts in real terms over the last 10 years, but in reality the problem goes back even further than that. Policies enacted by the Blair and Brown governments flip-flopped all over the place, wasting money on IT services that didn't work, and then insisting market forces in the NHS would lead to more efficiency, like they always don't. But the most important and least visible policy change was at the very top. Blair's government, after getting into an unnecessary fight over doctor pay and contracts, gradually rearranged the system to take the top doctors out of the decision-making process. His health ministers took less meetings with doctors and more meetings with financial experts who were in charge of managing budgets in the new foundation trusts. These financial types eventually took over all decision-making roles in the NHS, while doctors were largely kept out, a trend that continues to this day. The prioritizing of finances and efficiency over patient care was not a decision made to decrease wait times like they claim. In fact, some doctors claim they were told to delay specialist referrals on the orders of the bean counters, with a gun pointed at their paycheck, no less. This fetishistic lust for balancing the books is a death sentence for anything that purports to be a public service, because the priority of a public service is supposed to be providing the best service to the public. 
When British Rail was privatised, hundreds of rail stations nationwide were closed down and removed from the network because the people in charge of it were trying to make money. Small rural train stations don't make enough money for investors, so they get axed. Ticket prices get pushed up, staff get laid off, and you get the broken nightmare system we have today. The same is true of the NHS. Healthcare is by its nature an expensive business, especially as the aging population and the increased need for mental health treatment in a stressed out, overworked population keeps driving demand up and up. When the NHS trusts became foundation trusts in 2003, they were given more financial and managerial freedom, which is a cutesy way of saying they were allowed to make profit now and reinvest it wherever they liked. If your top people, the top not doctors, are too busy talking about ways to save money rather than ways to deliver better care, the quality of care is inevitably going to suffer because improving care costs, you know, money. This problem was pretty bad back in the late 2000s after Blair ran away from allegations of war crime. I mean, uh, resigned to make large sums of money from private corporations. I mean, uh, it was already bad. But since then, the focus has shifted from making the NHS efficient to explicit open privatization. Privatization is a problem for many reasons, but in healthcare it's particularly insidious. Because if you cut corners on a safety net, you're really just cutting holes in it. As the holes get bigger, more and more people begin to slip through the cracks and faceplant onto the asphalt. It began small, as it always does. Outsourcing catering and cleaning services, which probably got worse. Outsourcing construction and maintenance under the PFI policy which bled the NHS budget with high-interest loans and construction contracts, some of which lasted decades. This wacky piece of legislation made the cost of building new facilities nearly double, double what it could have been if they just borrowed money from the government. Then the bomb dropped, a bomb called the Health and Social Care Act of 2012. In short, this forced the NHS to put any service that could be provided by the private sector onto the auction block to be sold to the lowest bidder. NHS money was then being handed over to for-profit care providers who would then cut as many corners as they could and skip off to the bank with the money they saved. I was actually working in social care just after this passed and I saw the effects of this decision play out. When I started, I was not only paid less than the NHS staff who had been there before the act passed, but the company in charge was actively cutting their pay to match mine. Training went from in-person meetings with qualified experts to PowerPoint presentations that we were instructed to do on the job. During hours, we were supposed to be looking after people. The inevitable result of this was many of the experienced staff quitting or taking early retirement, and a heavy reliance on the new cottage industry of agency staff. Staff which cost the provider double, but are paid the same as us, because the agency takes 50% profit on every hour they work. The problem with over-relying on agency staff is that unless they work with you regularly, they require a lot of management to do the job properly sometimes. This isn't shade on the staff themselves, of course. I've worked with plenty of very caring and very hardworking agency staff, but every ward and patient is different, and agencies are notoriously bad at telling staff what the situation they're going into actually is. Relying on staff you don't know, and who don't know what they're even walking into, is inevitably going to decrease the quality of care, increase the chances of mistakes, and create more stress for the full-timers who have to keep in mind what agency staff can and can't legally do. There is a misconception put about deliberately that private companies are helping the NHS by investing and taking on the extra load. This implies that money is somehow being put into the NHS by private companies, which if you stop and think about it for a second, isn't how private companies work. Ever. Private companies exist to make profit for their shareholders. That's it. They never put money into the system. They take money away from the system and turn it into immediate profits for the owners. Like a swarm of leeches in expensive suits, they latch on and they take, at the expense of everyone else, including you, the British taxpayer. Yeah, those national insurance hikes that happened recently? Yeah, a chunk of that's going to a private care provider now. Some individual in some office somewhere who you will never meet, who will never visit the places that he runs, who didn't really need the money anyway and just got into this because it looked like an easy win. He is now taking your money. I'm just going to let that thought sit in your head for a moment. Are you angry? Good, because it's going to get worse. 
This attitude of cost cutting and profiteering in the short term, no matter what the long term consequences are, is I would argue the primary reason the NHS has been functioning less and less. It's the torrified philosophy behind the lack of investment in new nurses, low pay failing to attract new people to the roles, the cancelling of nurse bursaries, even Brexit preventing the NHS from recruiting overseas. All of these things become the giant elephant in the room we have now. Staff shortages. At time of writing, the current staff shortages sit at 10% of nurses' positions unfilled, 5-6% to of doctors' positions unfilled, and about 8% of staff in general positions unfilled. In raw numbers, that's about 110,000 people. Those positions are vital positions for the NHS to function, so how are they doing it? Overtime and agency staff, that's how. Nurses, doctors, support staff of all levels and types have all been working overtime and taking extra hours, and that presents a problem in and of itself. Agency and overtime hours sap the already thin budget even more than just hiring staff to fill those roles. This may be the reason that a lot of overtime has historically gone unpaid, if the reports from 2019 are anything to go by. How much overtime, you ask? 1.1 million hours. A week. Oh, and uh, it came out recently that the government is tricking non-EU nurses into pay-to-leave contracts, so when they try and quit, they have to pay out thousands of pounds, which, you know, that's fun. Good to see that the Tories are okay with immigration if it means we get to exploit brown people. Rule Britannia, right lads? Now you might be saying, okay Mr. Posh Boy BBC spokesperson sounding motherfucker, this is a very interesting history lesson, but what does that have to do with the staff burnout crisis? Well, very principled and topic focused understanding haver, if you were paying attention, you might remember the third element of burnout and the one that keeps the cycle going feeling a reduction in your ability to do your job. All the government's policies mentioned above have made the NHS less effective in its primary role of caring for people. It has led to hospitals going into debt and closing down, reduced access to help in rural areas, and centralisation of core services like A&E departments to fewer and fewer locations that were not designed to handle the strain. Staff working more than 40 hours a week, being unsure if they're even being paid for it, are not going to be able to mentally or physically work their best. It's just not possible. And encouraging people to clap for the NHS at 8pm every Thursday, when most of us are still working, becomes less of a nice gesture and more of a patronising sneer very, very quickly. We didn't need applause. We needed help. Watching wait times rise doesn't just hurt the public trust in the NHS, but it also affects the NHS's trust in itself. And the lack of real power to address the issues, even for senior clinicians, has led to more and more people losing faith in what they do, and that what they do is helping the situation anyway. Every drop of effort put into the system by frontline staff all comes to nothing if the bean counters keep forcing you to make do with less money. Staffing levels may be turbo crisis right now, but they were being whittled back further and further by budget constraints for years, until the numbers became unsafe. In a mental health ward, staffing needs can literally increase overnight, depending on a patient's behaviour and presentation. And every time something like that happens, the ward manager has to answer to the council of money men bitching that they're overstretching the budget for that month. If you wondered why the managers had the highest increase in stress during the pandemic, dealing with those concerns is probably why. No system, from a democracy to an under-11s five-a-side team, can survive if the people within it lose faith that the system can succeed in its goals. The actions of successive conservative governments have kneecapped the ability for workers of the NHS to do their job. And while your average nurse or even doctor may not know exactly how it happened, they feel it. They feel the work they do being less and less effective. They find out no matter how hard they work as an individual, they can't change the fact that the system is slowly, but surely, becoming worse for patients they have a duty of care to protect. And when patients complain to us, what can we say? I'm sorry? I wish I could do more for you? I know it's not perfect, but I've lost count of how many times I've had to say those things, and every time I do I can feel my will to keep going crack. If I can't even help people, why am I even here? This slow, constructed demise of the NHS's effectiveness is the final piece of the burnout puzzle. It crept up on us slowly, it took decades, but it's here now, 
and the COVID crisis was just the straw needed to make the camel's back creak. Many of us, not just myself, have fallen into the burnout cycle already, and the longer we stay under the heel of low pay, poor working conditions, and the feeling of the system working against us, the worse things will become. Noy Bevan, the founder of the NHS, once said, The NHS will exist as long as there are people with the will to fight for it. The burnout crisis is not just a health crisis, but a political one. The more it saps our will to work, the more it saps our will to fight for the NHS's very existence. And call me crazy, but I think that's what some people want. See, I think there are two ways in which people are controlled. First of all, frighten people, and secondly, demoralise them. An educated, healthy and confident nation is harder to govern. So what do we do? Give up? Let the government sell the NHS off piecemeal to American business interests? Let them force us into a world where we pay or we die? Let them steal and flog off the systems and infrastructure that we paid to build, that we still paid to build, that our parents and grandparents built, rising from the ashes of the Second World War, broken, traumatised, but determined to see a better world? A world fit for heroes. Can we morally let that grand experiment fail? I don't know about you, but I say, nah, fuck that. I'm not whinging. Your lips are moving and you're complaining about something. That's whinging. As a nurse in charge once said to me, if you want something fixed, don't just bring the problem, bring the solution. And I want something fixed. So with a stated goal of fixing the burnout crisis established, I'm going to divide my solutions into two categories. The short-term stuff to stop the outward flow of people leaving and plug the staffing gaps, and the long-term stuff, the preventative care, that I think will prevent this kind of thing from ever happening again. The first thing we need to fix is the lack of pay. I've already laid out how bad the pay situation is and why it affects people so badly. Maslow's hierarchy of needs puts basic physiological needs right at the base of the pyramid, for pretty obvious reasons. If you can't pay your bills and keep yourself fed, or if your colleagues are struggling to do that comfortably as well, you can't really be expected to continue working under those conditions. It's a big reason why people are leaving. A 15% pay rise, also tying it to inflation, for all frontline staff will be a good start. Not just as a deserved thank you for all the hard work during the ongoing pandemic, but to maintain staff numbers and make nursing a viable and attractive career path again. NHS workers should not be struggling to make ends meet under any circumstances. It's an essential job, and you can't expect anyone to do it at all if they can't support a household while they do it. It'll also probably cut the cynicism a bit and send the message that maybe the system is finally listening to us. Like I said, it's a start, but it's not the end. I certainly was in the right. The second thing we need to do is to establish a nationwide network for emotional support. A place where stressed, traumatized, and burned out staff from care assistants to doctors can go in to address and receive treatment for the emotional harm done by this job. People may cringe a bit at this and say, well, I don't want to talk about it. And that's fair, no one is forcing you. But for those of us that do want to talk about it or need to talk about it, and for the future staff that may need to talk about it, it's important to know that the opportunity is there. The effects of that opportunity being there, advertised and readily available, has another effect besides addressing the harm already done. It will do a great deal to reassure staff that feel depersonalized and cynical, that feel like a cog in the machine, that even if this is a machine, it's a machine that cares about its parts. There's data to back this up too. NHS staff who have engaged in support groups and talk about the stresses of work have shown more tolerance to the stress of the job than those who don't. We can expand that and make emotional support a guaranteed right for all of us, allowing us to break the cycle of burnout before it gets out of control. Lord knows it would have helped me. To be honest, we don't even need the system to get the ball rolling on this one. We could do some good with a few Facebook groups for people to vent on. Just an idea. The NHS is underfunded. We all know it, we all acknowledge it, but with all the politicians on both sides screaming about making the NHS more efficient, let's face it, their ideas have failed to do that. And the NHS is still underfunded to the tune of billions. 
No matter how efficient it becomes, the NHS is always going to need more money every year as we tackle new health problems, the aging population, and occasionally a massive pandemic that shuts down our entire society. This isn't even a new thing. The NHS has been underfunded since the very beginning. It's time we address this. If the government expects us to do our job, this essential service that we provide, they need to give us the money to do it. We need more beds, more staff, more ability to provide that service, and that requires money. Every year, the NHS gives the government a list of what it needs and how much it will cost. And every year, the government tells the NHS to piss off and make do with less. This needs to stop. The constant penny pinching of the NHS bureaucracy doesn't just lead to short staffed wards on the day to day level. It prevents us from having what finance types call liquidity. If we wanted to change the NHS system to function better by updating equipment, expanding wards, offering new preventative care, whatever it is, we can't even talk about it because it would cost money. Actually funding the NHS to where it needs to be would go a long way towards fixing that. If we want to prevent staff burning out, we need to be able to do our jobs the best we can. And if it costs a little more to do things properly, then I think that's an investment worth making. These three things are important. They're essential things to do. But to me, these are just short-term fixes to the problems we face today. They aren't the whole story and they aren't a permanent fix. To do that, we need... Keep your hands off of my stack. The first thing we need to do before we can make the NHS the beacon of the world again is to get rid of the people who have been leeching off it for years. No, not chronically ill patients, not disabled people, and not old people either, you weirdo. Private companies. As I said before, most private companies don't really add anything to the NHS. They take taxpayers' money and skim their profit off the top by abusing their staff, their patients, and putting people in unsafe conditions. It goes without saying that these companies need to go. Social care needs to become an NHS service again, and it needs to be substantially improved. Private companies who provide services or goods to the NHS must have their profits capped and their prices strictly controlled. Pharma companies, medical device manufacturers, staffing agencies, even down to the catering, by law if necessary. The NHS is one of the largest healthcare providers on the face of the planet, so if you want to deal with it, you better be willing to lower your markups a bit. And don't worry if your name is GlaxoSmithKline, economy of scale will let you make a tidy sum either way but those exploitative contracts have to go. You had a good run there, fleecing the public whilst exploiting your workers and contractors, but it's over. Maybe try producing shitloads of that HIV vaccine I keep hearing about. Put some money into it. There's a good boy. In the same vein, the preferred finance system should be booted immediately, then set on fire and thrown into an infectious sharps pit. You wouldn't let a friend take a loan from Wonga.com. Why does our government insist on forcing the NHS to do it? Oh right, it's our money, not theirs. But these are the low-hanging fruit of systemic change. The easy, obvious things to fix. There is a much bigger one which I think needs to be addressed. One that I already hinted at earlier in this video. The NHS should be run by NHS workers. In the 1980s, Boeing was the greatest aircraft manufacturer in the world. Their planes were the best and they were highly profitable. Why? Because the lads and ladies in charge were aircraft engineers. Unfortunately, today Boeing is run by corporate pen pushers and money men. Some of them are the very same executives who ran a fellow aircraft company, McDonnell Douglas. By which I mean they ran it into the ground years earlier and were subsequently bought out by Boeing. The common saying on the workshop floor was, McDonnell Douglas bought Boeing out with its own money. And when the plane company wasn't run by people who make planes, all of a sudden they started to fall out of the sky. I bring this up because right now the NHS is having the same problem. All the decisions at the very top are being made by corporate types, money men, financial experts and politicians, not doctors. To truly revolutionise and fix the NHS, we need to depose the bean counters, the people who see staff as human resources and patients as performance stats. We need public policy decisions made by someone who has spent a day on the ward once in a while. Doctors, of all levels, must be eligible to run for higher office in the NHS, in a fair and, dare I say, democratic way. Doctors aren't flawless beings, 
They are humans after all. But there's no point in a junior doctor taking the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm if a chief executive has the power to order them to defer the treatment for two months because it's not in the budget. While the top positions would be a good start, in order to truly defeat the burnout crisis, we need to tackle the root causes of it a little deeper. Depersonalization and cynicism, the feeling of being unable to do your job well, are an emotional reaction to things you don't feel you can change. This is where workplace democracy comes in. What is workplace democracy, you ask? The basic premise of workplace democracy is that the way a workplace is run should be decided by the people who have to work in it. This can be done in many ways, by having managers be elected rather than selected, or the more direct approach of voting on policy directly. I can't get into all the details of that here because this video is already long enough. I'm only human and burning myself out by making a video about burnout would be too ironic for the universe to handle. If you want to know more, I recommend this video by Unlearning Economics. The guy is very well informed and he answers a lot of questions that you might have about this way of organising a workplace. NHS workers having voting power over the actions, policy directions and funding of the NHS would solve the burnout problem in two ways. Firstly, it would undercut the cynicism and personalization currently rife within the system. As things stand, support workers, nurses, paramedics and doctors have very little say in our own pay or working conditions, and that makes us all feel powerless. By taking people from cogs in a machine to the control circuits, we remove that feeling of our work lives being dictated by a government of incompetent rich boys who wouldn't know a 14-hour shift if it blatted them in the face with an ironing board. It would give us a way to fight for better conditions within the system as well as outside it. It's why you never really hear about violent peasant uprisings in a modern democracy. You hear about protests and strikes, but not uprisings. No matter how cynical your view of democracy, it's better than being ruled top down by people chosen to rule from birth. Because while you might not get what you want, you can at least have a say in it. Secondly, worker control would allow us to vote for and campaign more effectively for policies that make hospitals better and more effective. If you think your ward would benefit from having more things to do to relieve boredom, or if you notice a simple way of reducing cannula line infections, you can vote for that to be the norm. If we dare to dream harder, voting on what is done with the NHS budget could ensure the money goes where it is needed, and not get siphoned away into the private sector by building yet another coster on the hospital's dime. I know from personal experience that mental health wards work best when decisions on how to approach a patient's treatment are floated to the entire staff and questioned beforehand. That's how my PQ functioned for a long time. Everyone had a say at handover. Everyone got to give their thoughts before an approach was taken and concerns were always heard out. Even this limited and informal control of the workplace went a long way to keeping the team on the same page and helped us understand why we did things the way we did. But if anecdotes don't float your boat, there's data that demonstrates increased worker control leads to an increase in worker satisfaction, not just in factories or offices, but in the healthcare sector too. People are less likely to burn out when they have just a little bit of power to make change. The NHS becoming a democratically run system might seem like a long shot right now, and yes, it is. But it's worth remembering that the same was said of having a democratically run country not too long ago. The same was said of women having the vote, or, you know, women having jobs at all. In some countries, the idea of having an NHS is still seen as a long shot, despite the 70 years of evidence that it is both possible and better for society. Just because it's a long shot doesn't mean it's not a shot worth taking. And if the failures of our own current system tell us anything, it's that we need to fix our sights, look directly down the barrel, and aim carefully. It's easy to feel powerless in this world. Big, cruel things happen, whether we want them to or not. No matter what you want or what you need, countries still go to war, children still die, global pandemics ruin our lives for years at a time. Is this really just how the world works? What can I, a single person, do against this tidal wave of evil? The answer is nothing. Not alone. The easy way to change a world that runs on money is with money. And in order to get that kind of money, chances are you'd have to do something pretty evil yourself to get it. But while we don't have money, 
or the ears of politicians that govern our lives, there is one thing we do have. Numbers. The NHS itself employs 1.3 million people. Social care employs a further 1.5 million. There are millions of people out there, just like you, just like us, seeing the same things, feeling the same pressures, knowing the same depressing reality. It makes you wonder, with all these people, surely we can do something, right? Now, unions in the UK are not what they used to be. They were kneecapped by laws passed by the Thatcher, Major and Blair governments a generation ago. Within the NHS, unions are often seen as weak or corrupt organisations, organisations that fail to stand behind the workers when they need them the most. There are merits to those criticisms. I've even made them myself. Unions are toothless. Which is why you, me, all of us, need to join them and become the teeth. We're not here just to take part, we're here to take over! For 40 years, the political class has been able to use their money and their positions of power to avoid the consequences of their own actions. It's time for us to become the consequences. I'm not saying it will be easy, or free. It will cost time, energy, resources and willpower, all of which are in short supply for us. It'll involve arguments, contentious votes, and taking risky actions that the government will not like. It will require boots on the ground, people in the streets, facing down the police, unless they decide to march with us. And long hours of meetings, planning, and organizing, presenting our solutions to a public that will be told we are in the wrong. Have I scared you off yet? If I have, then I'm sorry. But let me ask you this. What's the alternative? Food banks? Low pay? Bad sleep? Antidepressants for the rest of your working life? The NHS is more than just a job. It's more than just a career. It's a family. A family that no matter how angry we get at it, will always be there when we need it. A family that saved my life and the lives of countless people every single day. It greets you into this world when you take your first breath and it'll be there when you take your last, no matter who you are where you came from, or what you've done with your life. I think that not only can we save the NHS, we can take the NHS and make it do what we do, save lives. We can make it better, stronger, faster, and cheaper. We can make it the envy of the world again. We can show every working person in this country and around the world that we don't have to beg for scraps from a class of aging rich kids who see us as numbers on a sheet. We can have what we deserve, if we just have the will to take it. After all, what do we have to lose but our chains? Hi everyone. Looks like this video is probably going to get copyrighted again, so if you fancy supporting me and the channel, um, go check me out on Patreon. I'm going to be adding some more tiers to the Patreon soon with original music and first read of the script, that kind of stuff. Um, let me know in the comments what you guys fancy. I hope you enjoyed the video and big love to all my NHS family out there. See you soon.